Welcome to the Communication Diva Podcast, Episode 14. Today's podcast is a feature interview with actor, writer, and award-winning journalist Mervyn Dykes on the subject of public speaking. Merv's advice on public speaking includes Know your subject and your audience well, don't fidget, smile, and put yourself into it. What Merv doesn't say is that it also helps if you can pull off a really cool New Zealand accent. Hi again, and welcome back to CommunicationDiva.com. This is Jen Swanson, and I'm glad that you're listening today. You can hear us also on Stitcher Smart Radio, and if you go to the website at www.communicationdiva.com, you'll see a big button over on the right-hand side, and that button is where you can download this app for free, and it's an app that you can have on your iPhone, your Android, your iPad, anything that you can pack around with you, and it allows you to pick and choose and create your own stations of all different kinds of podcasts and radio shows. And if you download it from the website, you can enter the promo code Jen Swanson. That's Jen with two N's. And you can be entered into a draw for a chance to win a $100 gift card from Stitcher Smart Radio. So check that out if you haven't already. It's a really neat way to uh, carry your podcasts around with you. And every time someone that you have put in your radio station list creates a new podcast, it's delivered directly to your device. So, there's my little plug today. Today we've got uh, an interview from Mervin, with Mervyn Dykes, who is coming to you from New Zealand, and I am here in Canada. So this is another Skype interview, and I haven't talked to Merv for a long time, so it's uh, it was wonderful to have a conversation with him. Merv is an award-winning New Zealand and Canadian journalist and author. He's got about 14 books out there now most of which you can find on Amazon. He's won a number of uh, writing awards here in Canada and in New Zealand. His latest one was in 2009. He won a Qantas National Media Award for some feature writing. He's also an actor. He's won a couple of Best Actor Awards here in Canada. And he has done all sorts of different things, including a lot of public speaking, which is what he's going to be talking about today. Merv uh, has uh, has run a theater company over the years. That's where I met him way back when. And he also is very interested in medieval reenactment. And he does a lot of work uh, doing those kinds of activities, reenactments and attending festivals and doing all sorts of things and even organizing some festivals. I'm going to put a, a complete list of all the things that he's done um, in his uh, little book biography on the show notes and uh, I will also have a link there to where you can reach Merv if you want to talk to him and and know more about him and also a link to at least one of his Kindle books and you can find more of them through the Amazon link on the website. So that is about Mervyn Dykes and without any further ado I'm going to turn you over to the previously recorded interview. Hey everybody, this is Jen Swanson. Welcome back to Communication Diva. And today I have a longtime friend and fantastic person, Mervyn Dykes, with me coming all the way from New Zealand. Hello, Merv. Hi, how are you? I'm just very well. How are you? Uh, That's a lie. You've got a cold. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I do. I do. And you might hear me all stuffed up because of it, but I'm hoping that it uh, won't come through that badly. So, Merv, you've got um, a really varied background. Merv is a, a writer, an actor. He's done journalism, public speaking. How do you keep track of everything that you do in your busy life? Well, I, I find that they're all related in one way or another. It's all about communications. Mm-hmm. And uh, each of them has a, a quality or a technique or a method or something, which I can use to apply to the whole. So I find them all related like different pages in a book or something like that. And so um, I don't find them being sort of alienated from each other. They're all part of the same whole. Uh, You know, I think that with communications, uh, it's so important, so integral to to life. When we came into this world in the beginning, 
the most important thing for us to do was to learn how to communicate with our mother. Mm -hmm. If we wanted comfort, if we wanted food, uh, if we wanted just to sort of, you know, to be with somebody, a connection, we had to learn how to communicate. And it's a very, very natural thing. And it's only when people get older sometimes that they mystify it a bit and get uh, terrified of the idea maybe of speaking in public. Mm. Apparently, uh, public speaking is the, is the number one fear in corporate North America. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, I get it. It's supposed to, be, it's supposed to be such a natural thing. Yeah. I mean, just, just imagine you've gone to the movies, right? Yeah. And it's been an absolutely great movie. And you come out of the movie and just across the road there's a friend of yours. You race up to them and say, hey, I've just seen this really great movie. You've got to go see it. It's wonderful. <laughs> and you're communicating. Right. And it's a very natural, instinctive thing. And um, and yet, yet, on the other hand, people can sort of make themselves very formal. Um, once uh, in my incarnation as a newspaper reporter, I interviewed a police handwriting expert. Oh. And he said, he said you know, people have two forms of handwriting. They have the workaday note-taking one, which maybe only they can read. And sometimes I can't read mine. I have to hold it up in the office and say, hey, guys, what have I written? <laughs> but, uh, and then there's the sort of the formal, I am applying for a job, handwriting. And, uh, and in the same way, they have two different forms of speech. Oh. They have the workaday knockabout speech with a friend, which might even include sentences that aren't completed, you know, because you're on the same wavelength, you know, what each each one wants, um, and uh, then you have the very formal, <clears throat> on this most auspicious occasion, we are gathered here today, and they sort of make it a real real mess, you know, it's, um, they forget that it's all about communications, That's you right. know, and, uh, you know, I, I sort of, as you know, I have a strong interest in things medieval, and when I do medieval reenactments, one of the things I do is storytelling, and that's communications. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the very first communications people had. If you go back in the old days, a storyteller was always welcome at the fire. Huh. Not to burn him up, but to uh, have him sit, in, sit in there and give him something to eat and drink and say, go. And then tell stories to people and get them involved and entertain them. Yeah. And they used to love storytellers. They used to love the communication. So what I'm saying in a very long-winded way <laughs> is this very, very natural thing to want to communicate. And we need to think back to that uh, initial enthusiasm or joy we had, you know, right from the very beginning, uh, and not lose sight of it later on. We, we plaster things over with so much messy stuff that we, we spoil it for ourselves. That's true. I want to yeah. just ask you a question about the different voices, because I noticed that... Um, uh, we were at a restaurant the other night for dinner and the server came over and she definitely had her serving voice on and oh, yeah. she kept saying how are we doing would we like more of this would we like and it was driving us crazy she was very earnest uh -huh. and very sweet and yeah. very lovely but she definitely was putting on a strange voice her work voice mm -hmm. so do you notice that people do that when you're in public speaking when you're doing public well, they, they, they often do. And I've also done a little experiment at supermarkets. Oh. You know, this is this is quite fun because uh, you go to the checkout and you're wearing your weekend garden grubbies. <laughs> and only take very careful note of how they treat you. Right. Then a bit later on, you'll come back to the same restaurant and go through wearing a suit. Right. And compare the way they treat you yeah. um, to the way they treated you earlier. Right. I find it really funny. You know, it's sort of, I like to play a few little games with it. No. I do that. I send my students out on that very same experiment and uh, tell them to dress dress up and then dress down and see the difference. Yeah. 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 It does have a difference in the way people treat them because people have expectations, you know, and they, they just sort of, um, okay, first appearances are good and everything, but once that first appearance has been established, you have to be able to uh, follow it up with something else. Right. It gets some tension. I find that in writing, uh, teaching, say, n uh, night school classes about writing, a lot of people will agonize over the, um, the format or the layout of what they write. And some can get it looking absolutely beautiful. You know, all the margins are just right, the type is clear and crisp, uh, everything is wonderful, centered on the page, da 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 da, double space, one side, and what's written is complete rubbish. 
<laughs> no, and so uh, you, they've lost you after the first half paragraph or something. Right. On the other hand, if the paper is a complete mess, maybe people don't even want to bother to get down and write it. But or, Sorry, read it. But uh, there's a happy medium in there somewhere. So to do with public speaking, is there something similar? Uh, I think a lot depends on the audience, the occasion right. or whatever. Right. Um, you don't want to distract from the message that you are presenting. Right. Uh, so um, I think, excuse me, I think that uh, you have to, before I start anything, whether it's writing or anything like that, I ask myself the question, who cares? Right. And with that who cares question, it helps you to identify your audience. And it helps me to sort of target my newspaper article or whatever straight for that particular audience and makes it more effective. Right. I say to people, if you're going on a turkey shoot, you aim at the turkeys. <laughs> you, know, you, don't, you don't sort of just wildly wave the gun around and expect turkeys to fall from the sky. You have to be fairly directed and focused. Now, when I'm, when I'm public speaking, um, if it's a sort of a... Uh, a fairly formal setting, I am usually fairly formal. Right. If it's a casual setting, I can be very casual. But behind that, you still have basic principles of speaking that you have to follow. You may package them slightly differently. I don't like it, for instance, when somebody gets up at the, um, the podium and they're so nervous, they keep waving their hands around or doing stuff like this, you know. And I'm, <laughs> You know, uh, it sort of puts me off. It's fidgety, it's distracting, right. and I lose connection with what they're saying. Um, on the other hand, I uh, like people who look at me, talk to me directly. I've asked the question, who cares? And I know what I, I'm, I'm concerned about. And they speak to those concerns. You get some people who say, well, if you're public speaking, just pop up there and tell a joke and that'll break the ice and you'll be away. <laughs> and that looks so awful when you see it done most of the time. It, it's just awful, awful advice. So you, you have to be up. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, so you need to know your audience and then you need to speak to them specifically. I, I think so, yeah. 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 Huh. And don't fidget. Don't fidget at the podium. Um, don't dart your eyes around like this. <laughs> because you're nervous. Makes you look shifty, like a used car salesman or something. <laughs> and you know that's not what you want. That's not the look that you're going for. So you just engage them. You know, you just look at them and talk to them. And I find that the world's greatest beauty aid, it even works with me sometimes, is a smile. Right. And if you can smile, if I say run out of words suddenly, I'll just look at the audience and smile. <laughs> and I'll see the half the front row smiling back. You know. Yeah. And so we'll have a laugh and we'll carry on. Um. Some people say, oh, well, it's all very, all very well for you because, you know, you've worked as an actor and things like that. When you get in front of an audience, um, you know, you're perfectly at home. Right. That, 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 in a way, is a lie, as you know probably from your own experience. Nervousness is always there. Yeah. And if the nervousness wasn't there, you would feel worried. Um, see, when you're standing in the wings waiting to go on, um, I, I, I feel a tension and excitement and nervousness, everything. And if I didn't have that, when I finally went out in front of the audience, if I was completely flat and laid back and relaxed and everything, it would become a whole big yawn and I would sort of lose the sharp little edge. So what, I, what I'm saying is that the nervousness is actually a form of energy. Right. And as a form of energy, you can take that and use that to your own ends to put a sort of a sharpness or an edge to what you're saying. Uh -huh. If you can harness that nervousness, you can use it to help you with your presentation. Do you? Uh, have, sorry, I was I was just going to ask if you have a, a structure to to the talk. Do you have it written down, or do you just talk um, off the cuff, or do you have it written on cue cards, or how do you deal with that? Again, it depends a lot on the audience. If it's something that's very formal and everything has to be said very very precisely, right. I will have it written down. Whether I follow that is another thing. Uh, sometimes I have my papers on the podium there and I have my finger where I'm supposed to be talking and I will speak openly, you know, and then just look down very, very quickly, pick up the threads and move down to the next one. I prefer to speak without the notes. 
because, uh, well, I, what I'm saying though is this, this is a little bit misleading. What I'm saying is that I don't like to read. If you read something, you put your head down like this. Say, hello, I'm very glad to be here today. It's very nice to see you all. But all they're seeing is the top of your head. So you really have to look out and engage. And uh, so other times I might just have a, um, a skeleton there, just a few points that I want to touch. Sometimes I will have nothing. Now that is very misleading because uh, you don't get up, you're totally unprepared. You may be on a subject that you know so well that you can speak comfortably without detailed notes. Um, I'm just trying to think of an example, for instance. Uh, I was in a speaking competition once. It oh. was, yeah, uh, you had to speak for three minutes on a topic that was handed to you oh. as you approached the podium. Yikes. And the guy, <laughs> and the guy before me was uh, really cracking people up. He was as good as a stand-up comedian. And they were roaring and hooting and carrying on. And I thought, goodness me, how am I ever going to follow this fella? You know? yeah. I'm going to be so flat after him. It's going to be really bad. And then I thought to myself, no, um, what he is doing is creating an energy. That's very nice for him and, and all that sort of stuff. If we were in a professional situation on the stage, I could call him my warm-up act. <laughs> so I have to find a way to hijack all the energy that he's created. So as I go to the podium, I'm handed my little paper and it just says, Autumn Leaves. Oh. And I go, oh yeah. So I got to the podium and I looked at everybody and I smiled pleasantly and said, now ladies and gentlemen, Autumn Leaves. <laughs> In three minutes, so do I. <laughs> <laughs> And without one moment, I'd stolen all the previous guy's laughter. And so I quickly rounded off from the hilarity and presented my serious point and sort of finished, you know, and uh, I won. Wow. <laughs> Congratulations. So I, went from, yeah, I went from a situation where I felt really insecure because the guy first seemed to be sort of knocking them dead and having a wonderful time. Uh, and I stole all his laughter. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can't imagine that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> this is the guy who used to practice falling down the stairs to shock everyone <laughs> in our theater productions. You remember that? Yes. <laughs> you would come tumbling oh. down the stairs all of a sudden. And <laughs> the first time you did it, you scared the wits out of me. <laughs> if the show seemed to be falling a little bit flat, you know. I, mean, I, I remember you coming up to me once and saying, no, there's a hole in the seat of your pants. <laughs> <laughs> my goodness, no wonder I felt drafty, you know, because I had my I had some new trousers on. I'd been told by the boss at home on no account to fall down the stairs. Right. And it was just too inviting. I couldn't resist it, so away I went. But they put some non-skid pads on the steps, which made it harder for me to get takeoff. Right. And so I struggled to get takeoff, and I must have hit the stairs in a funny way and torn the seat out of my pants. <laughs> so there we go. We finished the whole show with a big window in the back of my trousers, so... I've learned to do as I'm told. There you go. <laughs> well, there, uh, improvising is a good thing too. What about um, in back to public speaking? Because we could talk for hours about all sorts of things. <laughs> um, what about improvising? Going off on something that comes out of the audience. So if the audience suddenly has a question, do you ever allow questions while you're talking? Or do you ever feed off the energy? Can you tell what's going on with the energy in the audience? And and you suddenly just go off on a new tangent. Well, in theatre you feed off the energy in the audience. Right. I used to skulk in the wings waiting for a sound. The first snigger or giggle or something. I'd say, ah, there's somebody out there. They're alive. You know, <laughs> let me at them. You know, and I'd go out there and sort of get into it. Now, when you're speaking, if you're getting an obvious reaction from the audience, mm -hmm. and it's a good one, you know, you feel the adrenaline rush. And you feel yourself sharpen. And you get to a point where you know you're doing well and you know you're connecting. And that's a wonderful thing. If they, uh, I don't normally sort of do necessarily take questions in the middle of a talk, but certainly towards the end. Uh, I, I sort of take the line that I have a, have a message to present. If it's a very informal situation, you know, then you can take questions and go whichever way. But if it's somebody who's you know, asked me to speak about a specific topic, um, I'll present that topic, but leave time for questions at the end. Right. Um, 
it's fun. If you know your topic well, you should be able to, you know, handle questions. Uh, if you get really um, uh, worried by a question, uh, convert to Judaism. Now, I've heard that <laughs> it's, a Jew, it's a Jewish practice to answer, answer a question with a question. Ah, there you go. You know, and if you ask a question you can't quite answer, you'll say, well, everybody, what do you think about this? <laughs> Is this something that's concerned you? You know, and you're still in control. Right. And then while they're sort of making noises and things, you collect your own sort of thoughts and you're ready to come in as the all-wise and all-knowing guru at the end. <laughs> oh, that's a wise tip. What about practicing? Do you practice your, your public speaking in advance? I know I have students who uh, have to do presentations about cancer in my classes and they spend a lot of time practicing. No, I don't. You don't? I don't. Never if I can help it. Because I believe that there has to be some element of spontaneity in the talk. Okay. And if you spontaneate yourself out <laughs> beforehand, you're going to get there and deliver sort of a technically bland performance. Now, I, I use the word performance very deliberately because, you know, public speaking is a performance. And um, I like people to think that it's, it's happening right in front of them rather than the person is just delivering something something by rote and this is the way it's going to go and I've got another 50 words to go to at the end of the line. You know, it's sort of, uh, so I don't rehearse to that point of view. If I haven't written notes, you know, and all that sort of stuff, I will review them. I will review them, but I'm very careful. The same thing when you're writing a book. You know, if I'm saying, hey, Jen, I've got this book that I'm writing and I'm in this particular situation and this could happen and that could happen and the other could happen and we could talk all about it. And all the sparks of spontaneity that might be coming out of me come out. Mm. And when I sit down to write it, I go, what was that that I was saying to Jen? <laughs> oh, uh, eh. and it's somehow never the same. Right. And it hasn't got the life or the vibrancy or whatever. So you can certainly rehearse yourself right out of a talk. Uh, all you have to do is know your topic and have a pretty good idea of, of your audience. You know, it's... Um, it's a this this is a hard thing because well people will say oh it's all right for him because he likes it yeah <laughs> you know and uh, but I started out as an incredibly shy person really yeah well I can see a sneer on the face. <laughs> Well, I, I just I've known you for a long time and I've never found you to be shy but that's interesting to know. Yeah, yeah. And if you look at a lot of actors, generally speaking, uh, a lot of them are quite shy in, in private life. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, you may not sort of think about that, but, uh, yeah, they let it all come out when they do the performance. And so um, some people even argue that perhaps because they're acting a part, they feel liberated and more able to uh, bring out some of their qualities. Uh -huh. you know? So, uh, yeah, whatever. So you started out shy, but now you're now over the years you've had so much experience doing this that uh, the shyness is probably gone, but the nervousness is still there right before you go out. The nervousness is still there, and yeah. I feel complete and utter dread if that ever left. Yes, yeah. You know, I feel a tingle and a tension when I step out there, and it's sort of um, you know, like they say, an old racehorse starts sort of pouring the ground and sort of <laughs> prancing about and is ready to go, ready for the race. Uh, the moment I stop feeling that, you know, I'll be pretty close to dying, I think. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. so for the listeners, you were mentioning uh, not fidgeting, and you were mentioning um, eye, smiling at the people and making eye yeah. contact and, uh, and, you know, expecting the nervousness and, and hoping that you have some nervousness. Are there any mm. other... Um, basic tips for people that have to do public speaking who maybe don't have much experience or are not looking forward to doing it? The main thing comes down to having a very clear idea of what it is that you're supposed to be or you want to say. Okay. You know, if I'm making a movie or something like that and I'm going to see a, a director, I have to be able to explain to him in about, we'll say no more than 25 words, what kind of movie it is. And if I can't do that, he's just as likely or she's just as likely to say, go away and do some more thinking. Yeah. Because you have to have that basic concept. I want to tell people three ways they can do such and such. You know? 
And uh, if you have that structure in mind, it will help you with your direction. If you've asked yourself the who cares question, for instance, um, when, I, when I'm teaching, say, journalism, I say every newspaper has enough material each day to fill itself probably three times over. Uh -huh. So the problem isn't getting material. It's in selecting the material. Uh -huh. Now, in selecting the material, they have to ask the who cares question. Imagine that we've got two stories that have come in onto your desk. They're equally well written, very well presented. Each has a good photograph with it. Now, one of them is about how to make an aquarium. Okay? Okay. The other one is about two simple adjustments you can make to treble the gas mileage on your car. <laughs> yes. And then you say to yourself, who cares? Well, that's a lovely story about the aquarium, and I'm sure a lot of people are going to be interested in it. But <laughs> just about everybody wants to know how to treble the gas mileage on their car. So, therefore, that one gets in, the other one stays out. Right. And so, when you're giving your talk, you ask yourself the who cares question. And you make sure you deliver to people, you know, what is going to be best for them. Right. Uh, the information that you really promised to, to deliver. One of the, well, one of the most entertaining people you can watch is the comedian Billy Connolly. Yeah. And he almost hardly ever sticks to the point. <laughs> he wanders all over the place with his, with his stories. And it's very entertaining, but he gets away with it because uh, if he, if he doesn't know what to do, he'll collapse onto the stage giggling. And I've seen him just fall to the ground laughing and rolling around. And uh, that is funny enough for um, the audience to burst out laughing too. And it allows them time to recollect them, you know, and sort of stand up and carry on again. But, we, uh, we were lucky to see him last time he was here in Vancouver. We went to see him. And it was, yeah. it was so much fun. <laughs> But yeah, you're right. Sometimes he just would stop and sort of giggle or grin and then figure out what he was supposed to be doing next, I guess. Yeah, he was just perfectly relaxed and, and carrying on, but uh, okay. he is performing. Yeah. You know, as a journalist, I've interviewed a lot of performers. And uh, one of the things you have to be wary of is that you don't get the performance. You know, if they, they know how to present themselves. And if you're trying to find the real person behind the name or the image, uh, it can be very hard to avoid being pushed away by the professional presentation. Uh -huh. I, I remember once as a, as a young journalist when I was working in Australia, I got to interview the, uh, the British comedian Tony Hancock, who uh, you know, was at one time very, very famous. And uh, I loved him. I loved his work and everything. And when I interviewed him, it was a oh, it was party time, you know, the party central. And I thought, what a wonderful person, a lively, engaging person. Within the week, he had committed suicide oh. because he was completely depressed and lonely. His yeah. marriage had broken up and he was a shattered man. And yet he managed to sell me a bill of goods when we spoke. Yeah. You know, so it makes you wonder about that. The, um, the performers, you have to be careful of them. <laughs> I, I felt really sad afterwards because I thought, well, gosh, was there anything that I might have been able to say yeah. that could have helped him, you know, or, or what, or anything I might have been able to, to do. Yeah. I was just another stop on the railroad route, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what about um, the, the opposite of that, too, is putting on a performance and then being different um, just just one on one when you're not performing. Um, I was at a lecture once. That was the most boring lecture I've ever been to in my entire life. This presenter was reading from a paper she had written, and she was using words that were way too big, and she, it was dry and it was dull, and I was getting the giggles over ridiculous things because it, I was distracted and bored. But when people asked her a, a question, she lit right up, she put the paper down, and she showed us her real self and how passionate she was about her subject. And at the end of it, I thought, I wish she had just thrown that paper out the window and just been there, you know? Yeah. This is, has elements of what I was saying before, uh, that people having a formal language. Right. The paper was prepared for peer review by other scientists. Yeah. And so she was dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's and using all the buzzwords and phrases, you know? But yet when she's speaking to people in public who uh, 
an intelligent lay audience who are interested in the topic, she needs to be able to communicate in that particular way. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know how you uh, feel about this, but I regard um, the master teacher, you know. Yeah. And my mind is Jesus Christ. Yeah. You no, know, he is the master teacher, the master speaker. Yeah. When you think about it in the New Testament, you read about him talking to, you know, very wide groups of people. And he uses parables. Yeah. And those are excellent. That's an excellent way to take an unfamiliar concept and pre present it in familiar terms. For instance, if he's speaking to housewives, he'll be speaking about bread and, and leavened bread. If he's speaking to farmers, he'll be talking about scattering the seeds and observing how they grow. Right. If he's talking to young people, he'll be talking about the bridegroom, you know, and things like that. And by identifying with them uh, through something that they are familiar with, he can then present his un unfamiliar or new concept on the back of it. And so, if you can find a way to do that, it's a, it's a really big help. So that comes back to knowing your audience. <laughs> it, it does. Um, I was giving a talk once about about conscience. Yeah. Uh, and my principle, which you have to have identified right from the start, was that everybody has inside them a conscience. With some people, it's very open and it's very out. With other people, it's been plastered over by all sorts of mess, you know, of daily life, that it, not even a glimmer gets out. Right. And so with my talk, I decided to, to use a parable. Uh, well, kind of a parable. Uh, I told a story about how when I was in a newspaper, a little newspaper, I did all the photography, and I wanted to build a dark room. And I had to build, a, build this dark room for me. And when he had gone, I went inside and closed the door and drew the curtain. And it stood there in the dark for a while until my eyes adjusted. Then I realized that there were glimmers of lights coming in from here, glimmers of lights coming in from there. So I picked up a roll of duct tape, tore pieces off, and started to plaster over the little holes. And before very long, I was in total darkness. <laughs> and that was wonderful for the dark room. There was no light getting in that could disturb the film. This was pre-digital. And so that was great. But I turned that around the opposite way and said that within each one of us, there is a light. Yeah. Now, do we stand there with our little bits of spiritual or mental duct tape and <laughs> plaster it over ourselves so that eventually not a bit gets out? We're totally dead and then inert to other people. Or do we let it all out? You know? <laughs> let it all out and, and uh, let our conscience is free and... Uh, act the way we would would like to act rather than the way other people think we should act. Right. I think that's really important. I used that to introduce um, my topic and then I got into sort of the nuts and bolts of the topic and at the very end of the talk I like to come back. Okay. So I came back to the dark room in my signing off and made the connection between the beginning of the talk and the end of the talk so that hopefully that nothing in the middle fell out on the way home. <laughs> So you, you um, bracket your talk then with something at the beginning and something at the end? Often. Often, Often. okay. okay. Uh, there, are, there are occasions when you do totally different techniques. It depends on your audience. Right. As a journalist once, I was having a bit of a campaign against a guy I thought was a bit of a shark. And uh, I was running stories about him in my paper and things like that. I went to see him one day and I said to him, What's your comment on such and such sort of thing, you know? And he raved at me and screamed at me and said, you can talk to my lawyer, you know, I'll sue you, I'll sue you, mention anything about me, I'll sue you. And I thought, well, okay, that's fair enough. I said to him, why? Are you getting so old now, it's all got so much for you, you can't handle it? And he blew up and told me everything I wanted to know. So I got <laughs> down and went away very happy. You know, and that's sort of not the technique you'd use with everybody, right. but with him it worked beautifully. Right. And as a journalist, if you have people say, saying, you, you use that and I'll sue you, and uh, you mention me and I'll sue you, uh, I look straight back at them and say, now, how is it I spell your name? <laughs> I'll talk to your editor. Here's this card. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it's totally diffused. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all, oh, it's fun. all communication of all different sorts. <laughs> it is. It so is. what about um, 
advice? Do you have any advice for people who have to do a presentation at a board meeting or stand up and talk in front of a group of people? And is there any, any big piece of advice you would give them? Number one, of course, is know your subject. Yeah. Okay. Number two is probably finding an interesting way to present it. Ah. You know, because if you're in a company, for instance, and you're making widgets, everybody knows just all about all there is to know about widgets. And you're at a very, very great risk of standing up there telling them how to suck eggs. Yeah. But if there's a slightly different way of looking at things that maybe might not have occurred to them, uh, which will present the idea the way a parable does, right. all you have to do is get that concept across to them then everything else about the technical bit about widgets will just fall into place behind it because they have that information already. But it's not maybe it's just a mental connection with the topic or an application to the topic that they haven't yet made that you have to bring to them. And so I say if you know your topic, you know how long you've got to speak, you know who you'll be speaking to, you can then shape your remarks to have the maximum effect. Also, you need to know whether there are other spe people speaking around you you know, for instance, if there's somebody else giving nuts and bolts information about widgets immediately before you, you don't want to get up and say exactly the same things again. Right. You know, because that's totally tedious. So you find out who you're speaking to and where you are in the speaking program, what they would like you to accomplish on their behalf, and, uh, and things like that. And then find an interesting way to engage. And this can often be done through a life story rather than a sort of joke pulled out of the hat. Well, here's a couple of good starter offer jokes, you know. Oh, <clears throat> there were three Irishmen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's a waste of, waste of words. If you can find something from life yeah. that's interesting, and maybe you don't have to look any further than your children or your grandchildren to make an observation. I have uh, my oldest daughter now is an old married lady. <laughs> and uh, when she was about, or oh, she wasn't quite two years old, uh, she climbed up on her knee, put her arms around my neck, gave me a big kiss right there and said, I love you, Daddy. Buy me some candy. Oh. <laughs> so where, where did that come from? Where? Who taught her that? Is it something that women have in their genes? I mean, she, was she, did she come into this earth with this sort of a, a con artist sort of thing built in already? Was she programmed to do this, you know? And uh, I've embarrassed her with that story lots since then. Yeah. But uh, it's a little life story that in the right setting could be really, really interesting. Uh -huh. Far more effective than any joke. Right. Because like, it's real. It happened to me. I experienced it. You know, I, I remember once when I was out fishing with the same girl at night, we were on some rocks and I made a mistake and it got dark very, very quickly and we were caught in total darkness. Oh. And we were trying to clamber down off these rocks and get back to the beach and I realized that I'd been very foolish. And so I'd place my little girl's, you know, well-being at yeah. risk. Right. Uh, it came to the point once where I got to a rock that I knew was about um, well, so many feet off the safe ground. And the only way I could get her down was to take her by the hand and do a Michael Jackson and hang her over the balcony. <laughs> yeah. And... Uh, I said, now, now, love, you're going to have to let go. And the sand will be about six inches below your feet. She said, I'm scared, Dad. I'm scared. And I basically said, do you trust me? And she said, yes. And then she let go. <laughs> Everything was fine. Right. You know, so little life stories can do wonders for you and well, for your poor. Because you can picture them and you can relate to some of them and they're you're right. They're far more interesting than, yeah, than just a joke. Yeah, good. I, it's, it's it's interesting. I um, I read something my oldest son had written once, and he uh, was being a bit adventurous at the beach, and he'd gone out a bit too far, uh. and he was caught, you know, out there, and he didn't really know what to do. He wasn't strong enough to get back into the beach. And then he saw me on the beach and he managed to signal to me and I jumped into the waves and he said, 
I saw Dad swimming towards me. There were times when I lost sight of him altogether. Uh-huh. Then he'd come up over the next wave and he'd still be swimming. Uh-huh. Then I'd lose sight of him again. And he'd come up over and he'd still be swimming. And he got to me and he took me back. Uh-huh. And he said that was a wonderful thing for him, to look and see his dad just pounding through the elements. <laughs> I'd forgotten all about it completely. Wow. Until he reminded me, I just, I, I just totally forgotten about it. And yet it's something that in his life had made an impression on him. And so uh, he can tell that story and he can tell it with a lot of effect. If and, I tell it, it sounds like I'm bragging. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and the other thing too is you don't know who your story is going to touch. So if yeah. if you if you're giving a talk or a presentation, if you're communicating something uh, through storytelling, you don't know how far that's going to go. No. You know, uh, you know, and oh. again, like your son said, you know, that made a big impact upon him. Who knows where our stories will end up? Because I remember stories that speakers have told, and I will go home and tell them probably differently, but I'll go home and tell them to people because I thought they were wonderful stories. And so you just don't know who's going to say, you know, wow, that was a great story. And how many, you know, all the six degrees of separation thing that goes on. Right. (laughs) Right. All right, so um, we're coming close to the end of our time, but I have a couple more questions for you. I wonder where people can reach you if they want to know more or find out more because you have lots of books you've written and and, uh, all the rest of it. And if people wanted to drop you a line, where would they do that? Well, my email address is probably the best, and that's just my name at gmail.com. So that's Mervyn, M-E-R-V-Y-N. Americans put put an I in there, (laughs) which really annoys me. So it's Mervyn with a Y, Dykes, D-Y-K-E-S, at gmail.com. Great. That's and my personal email, and uh, yeah, most of our messages come in on a, on a working day. Perfect. So uh, I, I will put that on our website, and uh, I'll put that at communicationdiva.com on the show notes for this episode. All righty. Now, if they want to read something more, um, there is a book I have on Amazon, you know, a Kindle book. Yeah. Uh, called How to Be a Brackets Better, close brackets, writer. Oh, good. And this one is basically worked out as an extension of uh, notes from uh, writing classes that I've taught over the years. I thought that I might as well write down a lot of these notes and sort of structure them sort of semi-formally. And uh, it ended up coming out to uh, quite a useful little book, which talks about a lot of the mixing of... Uh, forms of communication that we have discussed today. Now, um, I find a lot of, uh, how can we say, applications through basic newspaper work that I've done. Uh See, when when you write a newspaper story, for instance, 90% of the people are not going to read beyond the headline and the first paragraph or two, unless it's a subject that they're deeply interested in or unless you've caught their attention. Mm. You know, this is where journalists sometimes get confused of being sensational, <laughs> uh, which basically translates out sometimes as they've gone to the nub of the issue and presented that first. Right. You know, for instance, you could say uh, two men died in a crash on the Johnsonville Highway yesterday. Okay? That is the essence of the story. Everything else that follows is going to be a detail. Uh-huh. Was it a two or a three car pile up? Did they go over a bank? what were their names, all these other things um, sort of depend on that story. And they would sort of say that uh, this kind of um, structure with a story is called the inverted pyramid. Oh. You present the base, you know, uh-huh. the foundation part, the nutshell of it at the beginning, and then you descend. Now, I mentioned very early on about how in the old days they used to sort of, with hot metal, if the story didn't fit into the form, they would throw the bottom part away. Oh. So you had to make sure all your good stuff was up front. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I have always, even as a, as I say, a feature writer, I've always liked to come back at the end the way I do with talks and, and round it off. So people can get that book perhaps and uh, have a little bit more of a detailed read. Okay. Uh, the one thing I say in that book very early on is that there are many different kinds of writers. Ah. I should perhaps that there are many different kinds of public speakers. 
my style may not be yours. Yours might be something unique to you, totally special. It makes me green with envy. Okay? You don't have to make yourself like me. Uh, I'm a total package. And uh, I, I work according to the things that I have. So, so are you. Yeah. But it's the basic principles that are important. Knowing the subject, knowing your audience, where you fit into the scheme of things, what you would like people to carry away uh, when, when you sort of sit down. These are the things that are, that are really important. Not to be afraid of the nervousness. Try and find a way to harness it because it's energy. <laughs> and if you feel nervous, you just, all it does is prove that you're human, that you're alive. If you felt no nerves, you might be dead. Right? <laughs> and that'll come across too. Yeah, that'll that, come, will. that will. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Merv. It's so, been so good to talk to you today and to hear all about uh, some of the experiences that you've had. And uh, we're going to uh, we're going to sign off now. But if you want to know more about Merv, check out his uh, his book on Kindle, and I'll put that on the website again. How to be a better in brackets writer. And, uh, and drop him a line. I'm sure he'd love to talk to you. Thanks again, Murph. Thank you. Okay, this is Jen Swanson with CommunicationDiva.com. Thanks very much for listening, everybody. Until next time.